Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India This is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering, IIT Guwahati. And uh, what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different uh, properties of the host strain which you can use to generate the chimeric uh, organism or which you can use to generate the genetically modified organism. In this uh, discussion, what we have discussed from the last two module that we have discussed about the uh, prokaryotic as well as the eukaryotic cell. We have discussed about their structures and then at the end we have also discussed about how to separate the organelles and this is the what we have discussed in the module 1. In the module 2 we have discussed about the different types of media which is available for uh, growing the prokaryotic as well as the eukaryotic cell. We have also seen a couple of demos how to prepare the microbiology media as well as the uh, mammalian cell culture media and what are the precautions you should take when you prepare the microbiology media or the mammalian cell culture media and subsequently we have also discussed about the uh, couple of uh, salient or important uh, biochemical reactions what are ha happening uh, in the prokaryotic as well as the eukaryotic system. What in, in that what we have discussed, we have discussed about the glycolysis, Krebs cycle and then at, at the end we have also discussed about the anaerobic oxidations. Uh, in the same discussion we have also discussed about what is the advantage or what is the significance of each of these metabolic pathway for running the metabolism, running the life cycle of these uh, prokaryotic or the eukaryotic cell. And then at the end, we, once these uh, we have also discussed how to uh, study the growth of these uh, microorganisms, what are the different methods which you can use to study different, uh, um, different uh, microorganism or their life cycle. And then we have uh, very in detail we have discussed about the, uh, uh, about the different stages, what uh, a, a microorganism will go through to complete its life cycle and how the microorganism, how a particular bacteria grows in a defined culture volume. And now what we would like to discuss, we also want to discuss that the uh, uh, if, so uh, all this we were, dis all this we were discussing in context to prepare a genetically modified organism. And for genetically modified organism, if you recall in the lecture 1 itself, we have shown a scheme which you need to follow to generate a, a genetically modified organism or the organism with the improved traits by exogenously expressing the particular gene. So in the scheme what we have discussed, we have discussed that once you have an organism from which you want to isolate the gene. Uh, you can actually isolate a gene and then you uh, uh, do a restriction digestion of this gene and the similarly you can have the transforming agents uh, and you can do the similar kind of uh, combination of restriction enzyme, do a digestion and then you can put these two uh, molecules, these two components for a ligation reaction and ultimately you can do a transformation into the host cell which you would like to uh, uh, use for overexpressing or utilizing this particular gene and ultimately you are going to get a genetically modified uh, bacteria which is going to express this particular gene. Now in the today's lecture what we are going to study is how to isolate this particular gene and what are the different approaches one can use to isolate this different uh, this gene under different scenarios. So in uh, 
bio in the uh, uh, in the biological science what you have is you have broadly the two scenarios so before the uh, by before the genomic sequences were available the people were using a uh, different approaches to isolate a particular gene and there are different approaches which people use uh, when the genomic sequences are available so you have two scenarios in scenario number 1 uh, what you have is you don't know the gene gene sequence what you want to clone but what you know is about their character okay uh, and the other scenario what you have is that the gene sequence is known which means in this particular scenario the genomic gene uh, or the genome of that particular organism is being sequenced completely which means from this genome you know the gene sequence and uh, there are couple of examples in this category for example the uh, humans or uh, e coli or many bacteria mycobacterium tuberculosis and so on so this number or this pool of information is increasing over the course of time and that's why the uh, people are using this approach more often nowadays compared to the gene uh, this approach where the gene sequence is not known so this is the approach people were using when the genomic era was not started and people were using uh, the using this technique to isolate the particular gene based on its particular kind of trait so in this particular approach you have the two sources to isolate a genome uh, to gene sequence one you can isolate from the whole genome or the other 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 uh, pool is that you can use the transcriptome transcriptome is uh, nothing but the collection of the uh, messenger rna so these are the two sources from which you can actually be able to you uh, which, which from which you can be able to extract the genomic sequence gene sequence of your interest uh, for both of these approaches for the case of genome you have to prepare a genomic library or in the case of transcriptome you have to prepare a cdna library once you prepare the genomic library or the cdna library then you have to screen these Uh, libraries for looking for this particular gene sequence so there are different way in which the gene sequence could be uh, your particular gene sequence could be screened that that we are going anyway going to discuss in a subsequent lecture once you got the uh, after the screening you are going to get the particular uh, clone which will contain your fragment and then this fragment you can clone into a cloning vector or into a expression vector and check whether you your that particular gene is uh, expressing your desired product or not and in the in the other scenario when the gene sequence is available which means the gene sequ genomic sequences are available what you can do is you can take those genomic sequence information or uh, and then you perform a polymerase chain reaction with the help of the site specific primers which means you can use the uh, forward primer as well as the reverse primer and that you can use along with the uh, reaction mixture and as well along with the different types of enzyme what we use in the polymerase chain reactions and by this you are going to get the pcr product and once you got the pcr product then you can use this pcr product and put it into the cloning vector or the over expression vector and then you can use uh then you can use subsequently these uh, clones for the downstream applications so let's see under what scenario you can use the genomic library and under what scenario you can use the cdna library so that you could be able to choose the particular uh, subset in su uh, so that your sc your screen as well as your um, uh, your uh, protocol should be very very streamlined now let's imagine that you have the two plant one is tall and one is small so you have the two varieties of pea plant one is tall which is 
consider to be tt and you have two small and these are called small t small t now if these are the p plants in both the cases what you can do actually and you suppose you want to know what are the genes are responsible for making this p plant as tall compared to this p plant so what you can do and what is difference in this is that it contains the genome which is actually the xs chromosome plus this particular tall is actually containing a additional gene which is the tt whereas in this case it has everything identical uh, as it was there in the tall plant but what it has additional is the small t and small t these two genes so the only difference between the small as well as the tall gene tall plant is that the difference of these genes so what you can do is you can make under so if you have these kind of uh, questions where you can actually have looking for the phenotypic features in a particular plant and those are phenotypic feature which are genetically uh, induced for example the tall versus small then you can use the genomic library so what you can do is you can prepare a genomic library in this case and suppose this is a genomic library for tt and this is a genomic library for uh, for small t small t now what you have to do is you have to look for this particular gene into this library and that actually will be absent from this library so what you have to do is you have to do a subtractive analysis and that actually will give you a gene which is tt and that is the gene which is responsible for tallness in the pea plant on the other hand under what scenario you will use the cdna library or the cdna approach suppose you are actually uh, having the two uh, two boys uh, the boy 1 and the boy 2 so these two are human beings so their genome is identical whereas you can see in this case their genomes are different one is having the tt as a gene whereas all other genes are identical but the tall one is having the tt gene whereas the small one is having the small t small t gene whereas in this case you are actually going to have the identical genome xy because the both are boy but this boy is fair in color and this uh, uh, this boy is dark in color or you can imagine that uh, the uh, uh, you are actually studying uh, uh, how the color of a skin is being changed if a boy is uh, going from a shade to to sun so in those cases what will happen is the and you might have noticed that if a person is goes from shade to sun it color get changed from fair to slightly dark and how that happen is because the this guy is expressing some of the additional genes uh, like for example uh, xx which are responsible for giving a dark color to the skin so in these cases what you are going to do is you are going to generate the cdna library from these two individuals and then you will do exactly the same you are going to do a subtractive analysis and that will give you the only one gene which is been modified or the couple of genes which are been modified when uh, this boy is moving from the shade to the sun so in totality what we are trying to explain is that if you have the questions where the genome is getting edited 
or where the genome is getting modified, you can use the genomic library approach to identify the genes. Whereas, if you have the conditions where the expression of proteins are changing, which means the expression of the transcriptome is changing or the pool of transcriptome is changing, then you can use the cDNA library because the cDNA library approach actually uh, corresponds to the expression status of a cell. Whereas, the genomic library corresponds to the genomic content of a particular cell. So, you, rem you know that the genomic content does not vary if you change the environmental conditions or if you change the many of the uh, parameters. Whereas, all these phenotypic changes what you see under these uh, uh, conditions is mostly being done simply by uh, expression of the additional genes. So, if your question is about looking for a gene which is uh, which is getting activated when you are moving from the shade to sun, then you cannot get that in that question or you cannot get the answer to that question simply by looking at the genome. Because the genome of a particular individual will remain constant whether it go from the sun to shade or shade to sun. But under these conditions, the only thing will change is the expression of additional proteins or the suppression of the sum of the proteins. So, when if you do this subtractive analysis, which means if you do a cDNA library preparation under the two condition when a person is in the shade or the when the person is in the sun, these are the conditions will tell you the corresponding gene responsible for a phenotypic change. So, let us discuss these things in detail how to prepare the genomic library, how to prepare the cDNA library, how to screen them to get your uh, gene of your choice and then at the end we are also going to discuss about the polymerase chain reactions and how you can use that also in the modern world to, uh, to extract the gene of your interest from the genome uh, and you can use that for subsequent cloning applications. So, let us start with the genomic library. So, the protocol of the construction of genomic library is where and I have taken an example of human genome. So, what you have to do is you have to first isolate. So, in the step 1 you have to first isolate the genomic DNA from the particular human being for which you are interested to prepare the genomic library. Once you, gener once you have prepared the genomic DNA then you know that the, hum the human, the genomic DNA or the genome is arranged in the form of chromosome. Then the next step is that you are going to digest the genome with a suitable restriction enzyme, which in this case we are going to, we, we have given the example with the help of ECOR1, which is a restriction enzyme. And we are going to discuss about the restriction enzyme in a subsequent lecture. So, in the step 2, you are going to create the fragments of the genomic DNA, which can be done by simply restriction digesting the DNA with a suitable restriction enzyme. Once you got the uh, uh, these fragments, so after this you are going to get the fragments of genome. And once you got these fragments, you have to purify these fragments using the suitable technique, so that you have the fragment of a suitable size. So, which means you cannot take a fragment which is very large or you cannot take a fragment which is very small, because the, the reason is that a large fragment is going to correspond for multiple genes, whereas a small fragment may not correspond to even for a single gene and you are looking for a suitable size fragment, so that it should correspond to at least one gene. Once you got the purification fragment, then you are going to put this fragment into a yeast artificial vector or yeast artificial chromosome vector. So, for this what you are going to do is, 
you are going to take a yak vector then you also going to digest that with the eco r1 and now your your uh, your, your uh, 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 yak uh, uh, yak vector is ready for the uh, ligation reactions then what you do is take these uh, uh, fragments from the genomic dna and put it it along with the uh, yak vector and put it for the ligation reaction this particular fragments all these fragments uh, are going to get inserted into the uh, the vector and then you will do the transformation so in the last step you are going to do the transformation into the yeast cell and then what will happen is that different vector are going to carry the different gene and ultimately what you are going to get you are going to get the clones which will contain the single gene or the multiple genes which means it depends on the size of the fragment and uh, these colonies or these clones can be considered or it is going to represent the whole genome and that's why this technique is called as the genomic library which means it is exactly the same as the library which is present in our institute so our institute has a library which represent the different types of books which are present in the collection similarly a genomic library is going to have the collection of the genes which are constituting the genome and all these genes are going to be present in different clones which you will get by doing these reactions at the end so after the step 5 you are going to get different clones which are going to constitute the genomic library so let's discuss each and every step in detail so that you will be able to understand the uh, uh, the uh, process as well as you will uh, be able to perform if uh, if you can uh, get the necessary infrastructures so in the step one what you are supposed to do is you have to do a isolation of genomic dna if you remember in our uh, previous lectures we have also discussed about the isolation of different organelles so if this is what you are doing for from a mammalian cell for example if you are trying to generate a genomic library for humans it is a good idea first to isolate the nucleus instead of lysing the cells so what you can do is you lyse the cells and then you isolate the nucleus because that actually will make the genomic preps more purified and more uh, the quality of dna what you are going to get is going to be better so once you isolate the nucleus then you break open the nucleus and get the genomic dna so under this protocol what you are going to do is in the step one you will lyse the cells with detergent for example you can use the sds and you can use a lysis buffer the lysis buffer is actually the buffer which contains the tris edta and the detergent which is called uh, which is in this case for example you can use the sds so that actually is going to lyse the cells and will release the dna okay now apart from dna it also going to release many things for example it is going to release the other biomolecules such as protein and you know that dna may not be present alone dna may be present in the form of the dna protein complex so what you are going to get by lysing the cell is that you are going to get the dna which you need actually for for making a genomic library you are also going to get the protein then you are going to get the dna which is in complex with the protein apart from that you are also going to get the lipids and carbohydrates and other biomolecules so the first task would be to remove the protein which is actually either present alone or which is also present along with the dna so that what you will do is you will do that 
by putting this into a digestion buffer and this digestion buffer contains the proteinase K which is actually a protease, the SDS and so the, as the job of the SDS is to release the uh, genomic DNA and the proteinase K is going to degrade the protein whether it is the uh, uh, isolated protein means the individual protein or the protein which is bound to the DNA and that actually will release the genomic DNA or the it will free the genomic DNA from all types of the complexes. Subsequently, what you will do is you once you got the genomic DNA, then you will do the uh, alcohol precipitation and then if you add the alcohol to this prep, you are going to get the genomic preps. But this is genomic what you are going to get is not purified. You have to again do a several rounds of purification so that you are going to get the high quality genomic DNA and that you will do by mixing the genomic DNA with the phenol chloroform mixture. Once you add the phenol chloroform and mixture, what will happen is that the chloroform phenol mixture has two phases. You are going to have an aqueous phase and an organic phase. So, in what will happen is the phenol which is present in the phenol chloroform mixture is going to denature whatever the remaining protein present and that is how and it will keep the protein in the organic phase whereas, the aqueous phase is going to have the DNA part. So, once you do that what you are going to get in your append off is two layers one which is the aqueous layer and the uh, top you are going to get the so uh, on the top you are going to get the aqueous layer and at the bottom you are going to get the uh, uh, organic phase. What you can do is you can just remove this uh, aqueous phase from the top and store it in a different append off and then you can again precipitate this DNA using the alcohol, using the absolute alcohol and now you got the genomic DNA isolated from the cell, but you have to analyze this on a agarose gel or a agarose electrophoresis so that you can check whether the quality of genomic DNA what you have purified is good enough to prepare a genomic library or not. Because the genomic library preparation is a long process and it uh, you have to ensure that the genomic library, genomic DNA what you have purified is of very, very high quality. How to do that? When you run this genomic DNA on a particular agarose gel, what will, what you will get is you will see a intact band of genomic DNA and the other uh, characteristic feature of genomic DNA is that it runs very close to the well. So, if you load this into the well, no, normally the genomic DNA are very, very heavy. If it genomic DNA and it is not fragmented, it is intact, then it will grow, uh, it will, it will run very close to your uh, well. The other thing is you also have to look for if it has any kind of trailing uh, 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 signal. For example, in this case you will see a very faint band or faint signal what you see at the bottom. If it is very, very large or if it is very uh, uh, intense, that actually signifies that the genomic DNA what you have purified uh, is got fragmented into different fragments and all these fragments which means your genomic DNA you may show a fragment like this and if that happens it will going to show you a, a, a smear like this from the well which means you are going to you are not actually purifying the intact genome you are actually missing some fragment of some part of the genome in this process. So, in if that happens, you have to purify the genomic DNA, you have to increase the amount of the uh, stringency in your process because the every cell has the DNAs and these DNAs are actually going to degrade the DNA if you do not do the purification with a 
uh, with a lot of precautions and if you don't do the uh, do the isolation on uh, by following the uh, sub uh, subsequent steps meticulously sometime it also happens that when you purify the genomic dna you may be not doing the pipetting properly and because of that also sometimes the genomic dna get broken down into multiple pieces and uh, that also appears like a smear on the gel so now uh, we have purified the genomic dna from the um, uh, from the cell and now we will go move on to the next step so in the next step we have to do a generation of suitable size fragments which you are going to do with the restriction digestions so restriction enzymes are the enzyme which actually degrades the dna in a very very uh, precise manner uh, so restriction enzyme cuts at their specific sites so they are not non specific uh, as like dna is because dna is degrades the dna uh, on uh, random places so for this purpose what you do is you take an enzyme which actually cuts the genomic dna uh, very frequently although we don't know the the genomic uh, sequence of that particular organism but as an as a as an experience it is found that if you use the eco r1 bamh1 or saw3 most of the these enzymes are actually the 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 cutting site of these enzyme is very very frequent and they are very very uh, dominant or abundant into the any genome of any organisms uh, the idea of using of any of these enzymes either individually or in combination is that you want to have the fragment of suitable size uh, why it is important to have a suitable size because as i said if it is a fragment of very very big size you are going to have the multiple genes into that if you have a fragment of very very small size it is going to be a a fragment which will not going to uh, 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 represent even a single gene it may have a fragment of a particular gene so you need a suitable size fragment so that it will at least express at least one gene or maximum one gene or the flanking sequence of the other genes this uh, uh, so you if you if you digest the genomic dna with restriction enzymes either alone or in combinations most likely you will generate a suitable size dna fragment and uh, as the uh, so the if as an as the size of the genome is very big the number of fragments what you are going to get and subsequently the number of clones what you are going to get is going to be very very uh, large uh, if the fragment size is very big so uh, there is a formula for which uh, which you have to use to ascertain that the uh, the uh, genomic library is representing your fragment optimally the other way of generating the suitable size fragment is that you can do a mechanical sharing for example you can use the vertex so you can do a vertexing so if you isolate the genomic dna and if you do the vertexing uh, uh, it will actually going to also shear the dna and it will going to generate the fragments now as i said you have to generate a minimum number of fragments so that it will represent a particular genome now for example if you are working with an organism which is, has a genome size of 2 to power 10 2 into 10 to power 7 kb and the average size of the fragment what you are uh, putting into this is 20 kb which means the number of fragment what you are going to generate is 10 to power 6 so in reality this is a minimum number of uh, minimum number to represent the given fragment in the library whereas the actual number is going to be much larger now if you see if you want to calculate what is the probability that you will found your gene or your fragment into a individual independent clone then you can use this particular formula which says that the number of 
clones, what you need to represent your gene fragment into individual clone is uh, lin 1 minus p divided by lin 1 minus divided by n, where the p is actually the probability factor, which means uh, the probability through by which you are going to have a independent clone containing the your gene fragment and n is the size of the average fragment which you are going to use to generate the genomic library. So, you can use this particular formula to ascertain yourself that you are going to have the 100 percent probability that the my particular gene fragment is going to be represent in that particular genomic library. Now, we have generated the suitable size fragment. Now, this fragment in the third step, this fragment has to be inserted into a particular vector. But before getting into that, I would like to show you the genome sizes of different organisms. Now, uh, once you want to clone this into a suitable vector, what you have to re remember is that the genome sizes of different organisms vary from very, very small to a very, very large. For example, in the case of flowering plants, uh, it can go up to 10 to power 11 base pair, whereas in the case of mycoplasma, which is actually the smallest organism, it could be even 10 to power 6 uh, base pair. So, and all other organisms are in between these two uh, extremes. So, what you have to remember or what you have to consider is that the number of fragments what you are going to generate from these genomes are going to generate a suitable fragment size and that fragment size would be very, very large if the genome is very, very big. It is going to be very, very small if the, if the genome is also smaller. And so, depending on the fragment size which you are going to generate from these genomes, uh, you have to choose a suitable vector for generating a genomic library, which means there are vectors which can take up, uh, so there are vectors which can take up the DNA of different, different lengths. And every vector has a carrying capacity of the particular size of uh, fragment and accordingly you have to use the, uh, the vector which can be used to generate or prepare the genomic library. Uh, in the case of the fragments generated by the restriction enzymes, vector can be digested with the same enzyme and put it for ligation to get the clone. Whereas, in the case of mechanical sharing, for example, if you do a mechanical sharing, it is not going to generate the fragments which are going to have the cohesive ends. So, in those cases, what you have to do is you the subsequent cloning is going to be uh, very, very tedious and difficult. So, in those cases, you have to be little more, uh, you m might have to put more efforts in cloning those fragments. And uh, uh, one of the approach in that case is that you can put an adapter molecule and uh, to generate the sticky ends and then you can use those sticky ends to insert that particular fragment into the particular vector which also will going to be digested with an enzyme uh, for which the adapter molecule you have used. Now, uh, let us see, uh, so these, uh, these are the different vector which you can use. So, plasmid is the bacterial uh, plasmids, then you have the phage lambda, you have cosmids, you have the bacteriophage, you have the bacterial artificial chromosome or BAC and then you have the yeast artificial chromosome or YAC. Every of these or all these uh, uh, carrying uh, vectors have the different carrying capacity. For example, in the case of plasmid, you have the carrying capacity of 15 MB, whereas in the case of yeast artificial chromosome, you have the carrying capacity of 250 to 2000 MB, which means the this is good for the organism of a small genome, such as the bacterial genome or the 
uh, some or the other infectious organism whereas the yeast artificial chromosome is for the organism which contains the big genome or their genome size is very big for example the human so you have to keep these under consideration when you will generate the uh, particular size fragment and then use that for subsequent ligation reactions now once you have done the ligation reactions you are going to get the clone and then what you will do is you will take those clones and transform into the suitable host for example if you have used the plasmid then you will transform that into the bacteria and once the bacteria will take up that particular plasmid it is going to give you the colonies and each colonies are going to represent the single clone so once you do the transformation the clones are going to be transformed into the host to get the bacterial colonies a suitable host can be either bacterial strain or the yeast uh, we are anyway going to discuss the different methods of delivering clones into the host cell in our subsequent lecture and so by following these uh, four or five steps you could be able to generate the genomic library subsequent to this you have to screen the genomic library to get your uh, gene of your interest that we are going to discuss in the subsequent lecture now let's move on to the next approach and the next approach is called as the cdna library preparation now so, so CD, as i said cdna library you can use only if you are working with the transcriptome of a particular cell which means you are actually going to or you want to see the change in the messenger RLA pool of that particular organism or that particular cell type. Uh, we have already discussed couple of examples how, under what conditions you can be able to use the cDNA library to identify the gene of your interest. In a particular cDNA, so what are the different steps you have for generating the cDNA library? As I said, in a particular given conditions, what you are going to do, your first step is that you isolate and collect the messenger RNA. So messenger RNAs are the RNA which actually represent the transcriptome of a particular cell or particular organism. Uh, in the subsequent step from the RNA you are going to generate the DNA the RNA and the DNA what you generate is called as the complementary DNA uh, uh, or the cDNA and that is why this library is called as the cDNA library so from the RNA you will generate the DNA with the help of the enzyme called reverse transcriptase then once you got the DNA, double standard DNA, then you will insert this DNA into a plasmid or the suitable carrying capacity uh, uh, a vector. And once you got this, then you are going to do the transformation. That transformation will give you the clones and this is actually your genomic library. From here, you can actually uh, do the uh, screening and then you can be able to get the gene of your interest. So let us discuss how to isolate and collect the messenger RNA but before we will discuss about the approaches what you use to uh, collect the messenger RNA from the cell let us discuss what is the general structure of a messenger RNA. So a, a, a general structure of a messenger RNA that it has the four or five uh, uh, definite regions which are important for the functioning of a messenger RNA. So what you have, you have the five prime cap. This cap is, is important for protecting the messenger RNA from any kind of degradation and this cap is also providing the binding site for the uh, initiator messenger RNA or initiator tRNA. Then you have the 5 prime UTR region which is actually uh, the region for responsible for uh, guiding the uh, ribosomal assembly and then 
this is the coding sequence which means this is the sequence which is going to be responsible for generating the protein and this is the only sequence which is going to give you the uh, correspond uh, so this will be uh, getting generated from the dna uh, subsequent to that you have the 3 prime utr uh, that also has a specific functions in the messenger rna or the in the translation process and above to this you have a poly a tail this poly a tail is actually uh, a series of a which are present on the 3 prime end and these these numbers could be uh, of 200 it could be 400 could be any number and then this number of poly a tail actually decides the age of this particular messenger rna in the cell so what we can do is because we don't have to purify a single messenger rna because uh, otherwise you can use a coding sequence or a, a, a sequence which is which is complementary to coding sequence and that will give you the particular type of messenger rna but that is not what we want what we want to prepare is we want to prepare we want to isolate the messenger rna pool of that particular cell under a specific conditions so under those conditions you want to use a generic sequence or generic sequence so that you can use that as a probe to isolate all the messenger rna which is present in that particular cell for that what you are supposed to do is first you isolate the cells okay then you put under the lysis buffer and that lysis buffer is going to lyse the cells and release your messenger rna so imagine that you have isolated the messenger rna which actually contains a poly a tail on the other hand then what you do is you take the uh, agarose beads or the uh, sugar beads and all these sugar beads are going to have a poly t sequence and you know that as for the uh, uh, complementary uh, theory the a is always making a base pair with the t whereas the g is making a base pair with the c which means a is making double bond with t and g is making triple bond with c so exploiting this complementary or this affinity of the a for the t what you can do is you can take the uh, agarose beads which are tagged or which are having the poly t on the surface which means they are going to have the poly t on their surface so what will happen is these beads are going to bind your uh, rna which is present in the supernatant so you can imagine that it's going to be like this like this so if for one messenger rna will bind to one tail then the second will bind to the other one like that so what will happen is at the end the pool the messenger rna pool which is present in your cell lysate is going to bind the uh, the poly t tail which is present on these beads and these beads uh, and then what you do is you wash these beads with a washing buffer and then you do the elution once you do the elution the it is going to break the interaction between the poly t versus 2a and that actually will release the uh, the rna into the supernatant and that supernatant you can use or supernatant you can um, take to collect the uh, messenger rna so ultimately what you are going to get you are going to get the pool of messenger rna and uh, pool uh, with the uh, 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 in the in the in the in the appendix and the beads you can discard now you got the messenger rna in the second step you have to generate the cdna or the complementary dna which means you got the messenger rna now you have to generate the dna and this you have to do in three different steps for in the first step you will do a first stand synthesis 
of the DNA, uh, uh, which is which is the reaction which is going to be catalyzed by the enzyme called reverse transcriptase. And then what you will do is you will remove the RNA template, which means you are going to degrade the RNA from this, and then you will uh, induce the second strand synthesis, which is then you are going to do a second strand synthesis and that is how you are going to get the double stranded DNA for subsequent cloning reactions. So, there are many methods which anybody can use to do a cDNA synthesis. There are many popular methods which you can use. So, we are not going to discuss all these methods because because uh, uh, all these methods are exploiting one or other different types of approaches. What we are going to discuss are couple of very popular methods. So, one of the most popular method in this is that where you are going to use the homopolymer tails or it, this method is called as the uh, homopolymer tailing. So, in the homopolymer tailing, what you do is this method actually exploits the presence of poly A tail on the 3 prime of the messenger RNA. So, what you do is first you uh, use this poly A tail on the messenger RNA to synthesize the first strand uh, which you do by the reverse transcriptase and then you induce the degradation of RNA template and the synthesis of second strand. Okay. So, how to do this? In the first step, what you do is you put a poly T primer. Okay. So, once you put the poly T primer, the reverse transcriptase is going to use this as a template to synthesize the one strand of DNA okay. and then you are going to get the RNA DNA hybrid. Now, what you have to do is, uh, you have to degrade the RNA. Okay. So, once you got this RNA DNA hybrid, which is actually like this, you are also going to synthesize the uh, or you are going to add the uh, terminal C, which means you are going to put the uh, you are going to put the C and you are going to put an enzyme called terminal transferase. Once you do that, it actually going to put the CC uh, on the 3 prime end of both the strands. In this case, it is going to put on this side and in this case, it is going to put on this side. So, in this case, what you are going to have is you are going to have the CCC on the DNA strand because you have used the terminal transferase. So, that terminal transferase is going to put the CCC on the DNA on the uh, on the 3 prime end. Now, what you do is this DNA RNA hybrid, you will put it onto the alkaline sucrose gradient and you know that the alkaline solution is degrade the RNA and it does not pro it does not do anything to the dna which means if you have the rna dna hybrid and you put it into the alkaline uh, 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 solution that actually is going to induce the hydrolysis of rna molecule but it is not going to affect the dna molecule so at the end of this uh, this uh, centrifugations you are going to get the first strand of the cDNA. Now, what you do is you, you, gen, you put the second strand synthesis with the help of a poly G primer. So, what the what will happen is this poly G primer is going to bind to the poly C tail which you have added in the uh, previous step and utilizing this, this uh, poly G tail, uh, poly G primer is going to synthesize the second strand with the help of the enzyme called reverse transcriptase. Now, your gene is ready or the duplex DNA is ready that you can use into the subsequent cloning reactions, which means you can digest this particular DNA and you can put it into the cloning vectors. 
or alternate option is that you put the adapter molecules to this and you put it into the uh, into the cloning vectors. Now the next next approach is called as the gubber hoffman method or gubber hoffman method. In the gubber hoffman method, it actually synthesizes the first strand uh, uh, using the uh, polity tail. So and with the help of reverse transcriptase. And then in the subsequent step, what it do is it, it instead of putting into the alkaline sucrose gradient or alkaline sucrose solutions, what you do is you treat the solution with the RNAs H and then you use uh, RNAs H. So what happen is the RNAs H actually degrades the RNA in multiple places and that is how it actually generates the primers or are that the, the, the remaining RNA molecules behaves like a primer and then you add the DNA polymerase. So, what will happen is these primer, these RNA molecules are working as the primer and the DNA polymerase using the, uses these uh, RNA fragments and to synthesize the second strand. So, that is what is written here in this approach. After first strand synthesis using the oligo DT primers in the presence of reverse transcriptase and DNTPs, the DNA RNA hybrid, okay, the DNA RNA hybrid is treated with uh, uh, RNAs H. So, RNAs H is a very, very specific RNAs which actually detects and degrades the RNA when it is present along with the DNA. So, in that what happen is it produces the NICs at the multiple sites that is what you see here right. It produces the NICs at multiple sites and the remaining RNA which you can use as a primer for the DNA polymerase. So, in the subsequent step what you do is then you use the DNA polymerase to perform the second strand synthesis using the multiple fragments of RNA as a primer to synthesize the new strand. And at the end what you are going to get this is this method is going to generate the blunt end uh, DNA which means you are going to get a, a DNA with no cohesive ends it is going to be a blunt end which means this DNA if you use this method you have to use this D, uh, you have to use either the restriction digestion or you have to use the adapter molecules or you have to use the linker molecules to put this DNA into the cloning vectors to prepare the cDNA library. Now the next step is the cloning of these cDNA into the suitable vector. So, in the subsequent step what you are going to do, you are going to do, do exactly the same what we have discussed before as we discussed for the genomic library preparation. Once your D cDNA library is, once your cDNA is pre prepared, then you will digest those or you will use the adapter molecule or you use the linker molecule and insert these uh, fragments into the suitable vector depending on the size of these fragments. And then you will transform those into the suitable host either the bacteria or the yeast and that actually is going to give you the cDNA library which is going to uh, represent the transcriptome of that particular organism in uh, that particular uh, conditions. Which means if you use the cDNA library you can actually be able to study the expression, st expression uh, status of that particular cell whereas if you use the genomic library you are going to use the changes in the genome of that particular organism under a different under the uh, subsequent uh, under the specific uh, treatments. Now subsequent to this whether you have prepared the genomic library or whether you have prepared the cDNA library all these uh, libraries have to be screened using a particular type of criteria to isolate your particular gene. And this is what we are going to discuss in our subsequent lecture. So, 
uh, what we have discussed so far in this in this lecture is that we have discussed under what are the different approaches uh, are available uh, for you to isolate a particular gene sequence. Uh, you have the two different approaches, you have the approach when the gene sequence is not available or you have the approach uh, when the gene sequence is known and under this we have also discussed about how to prepare a genomic library or how to prepare a cDNA library and now in the subsequent lecture we are going to study how to screen the genomic library or the cDNA library to isolate your specific gene sequence. Thank you.